everybody. Um, welcome to the SALT session, uh, part of the Innovations Festival. Um, I've got some housekeeping rules just to go through, um, which some of you or many of you will be um, used to if you've attended previous sessions. Um, today's session is being recorded and recordings are going to be available to festival delegates as soon as possible after the session. Uh, please keep your microphones on mute during the presentations. And if you're happy to keep your cameras on, that would be great so that people can uh, see your faces or you may turn them off. There'll be three talks in this session. The first two will follow on from this introduction and then there will be a 15 minute break before the concluding talk uh, and a question and answer stroke discussion section. Speakers are going to do their best to keep to timing set out in the session timetable. Um, we have the opportunity for questions at the end of each session but please make use of the chat facility if you want to. Um, when we get to the Q&A succession session, you can raise your virtual hand to speak and wait to be invited to unmute your microphone. And we want today to be a positive experience for everybody and welcome discussion and debate, but would ask you to show respect, courtesy and consideration to everybody here. If we feel this is not being shown, we will remove people from the event, but I'm sure that won't be necessary. Um, I've got a slide here of um, three publications um, that are linked. Uh, there are links into the um, Shed uh, events uh, platform. Um, the Salt Industry book that Annelies and I wrote, Shire Publications. Um, the EcoSal Atlantis project book that was the forerunner of uh, before we set up EcoSal UK. Um, fantastically illustrated book, but it's all in French. Um, but it's well worth getting if you haven't got it. Uh, and Tom Lane's latest book, Minerals from the Marsh, which will feature heavily within his talk. And a reminder of the programme here, um, Sleeching Mounds and Pan Houses, um, The Long Industrial Revolution by David Cranston, uh, The Archaeology of Salt Making, The Locations of Surface, Buried and Submerged Sites in Lincolnshire by Tom Lane. And then I shall be showing some digital reconstructions of salt making sites and the different processes that can be found around the UK. I really hope though that you'll be able to take part uh, in the discussion because we're seeing this as a knowledge transfer uh, and an exchange of information session as much as a set of uh, three presentations. So if I stop that general slide now and I will go into um, uh, we want now David Cranston's talk. Sadly, David Cranston isn't available to join us um, today. Um, those of you who know him, he's still suffering um, from ill health and mobility issues. And we ran through a series of options whereby um, he could um, record his talk um, or perhaps he could send it to one of us to record. We decided in the end it would be better if he sent in, uh, in his slides and a script uh, and that I offered to read uh, his presentation for him. As it's all based in the north of England and now I'm based in Cumbria, a lot of these sites are actually uh, familiar to me. So if there are any questions about David's work, uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer them or we can pass on your inquiries and uh, David can get back to you. So as I say, David sends all his best wishes to you and is sorry that he can't this virtual, I can't attend this virtual event in person, if that makes us any sense to you. So this paper is based on his current research on coastal salt making. Um, I go back to the other slide because I've put a picture of David in uh, as if he was talking to you. So this is based uh, on salt making from seawater, mainly in the north of England and southern Scotland. And it's work that's still in progress and he's hoping to uh, carry on with it or perhaps gather together other people who may be able to uh, assist in carrying out work in the future. So there are illustrations from the Solway Basin and then other sites outside the northeast. Seawater contains 3.5% salt, whereas a saturated brine contains nearly 30%. Seawater must therefore be concentrated or strengthened from 3.5% to 30% before any salt will crystallise out. Or to put it another way, it takes about nine times as much energy 
to produce a given amount of salt from seawater as it does from the saturated brine. Andrew, sorry to interrupt you. Um, we can't see the slides properly. So if you need to just double click it. How's that then? It's just showing the um, your screen at the moment. How odd. Um, that's better, yeah. If you start from the beginning, that should be fine. Excellent, thank you. Is that better now? Yeah, that's great, thanks. Sorry about that. It seemed all right from my screen. Um, so what got me, and when I'm reading this, you must read me or I as David, and what got me interested in coastal salt making was the realisation that there have been a number of very different technical solutions to that problem. And that they, they leave such different field evidence that they regularly get either misinterpreted or missed altogether. I'm also interested in the archaeology of identity and salt making struck me as a useful case of how technology did or did not differ between England and Scotland in the medieval and post-medieval periods, and between Britain and other North Sea countries. There have been at least four processes for making salt from seawater in Britain uh, during these periods. The first one is solar evaporation, where seawater was run or pumped into a series of shallow ponds, where its brine content was concentrated by evaporation under sunny summer conditions. And this process was either taken to completion where salt was crystallized out by evaporation, hence the term total solar, or used to produce a con concentrated brine that was then boiled, hence the term partial solar, as, as was latterly the case at Limington. Uh, and this is a surviving salt house uh, that still survives uh, in Limington. The total solar process was the normal method in Southern Europe and Western France and it's how most modern sea salt is made. Within Britain, the partial solar process was used on the south coast, at least from the early 17th century. And there do, so does seem to be occasional general, general, genuine references to solar salt making elsewhere, including, to my surprise, a total solar site at Ross near Belford in Northumberland in the 17th century, and a partial solar one at Beadnail, uh, also in Northumberland in the 18th. But outside of Hampshire, it was not the normal process. Secondly, sleaching, where salt encrusted surface of silts or fine sand, but not coarse dune or ballast sand, was scraped off in summer and the salt content leached out with seawater, normally in filter pits lined with peat. And this can happen naturally, as in the photograph on the left hand side. And the uh, excavation on the right is from Waynefleet uh, St Mary uh, in Lincolnshire. The resulting strong brine was boiled in a salt coat, a small building housing small lead pans using wood, peat or furs as fuel. This I'm sure was the main medieval process in most of England and southern Scotland. The main field evidence for salt coast place, place names and what can be vast mounds of plain waste silt here forming most of the land surface on the Lincolnshire coast at Marsh Chapel. And the process, but the process needs a silty coast, typically an estuary or a salt marsh. So not every piece of coast was suitable for this process. Thirdly, the panhouse process, a simple boiling process without prior concentration. In the panhouse process, seawater was taken uh, in a bucket pot or a sump on the foreshore and baled or pumped to a salt works above high tide level, where it was allowed to settle, then simply boiled off in large iron pans in a pan house using coal fuel. Most pan houses were located on rocky coasts. Uh, perhaps for the availability of relatively clean water or the advantages of a low cliff or steep slope for raising seawater from a sump below normal high water mark to a panhouse above the storm tide level. The majority were on the uh, near coastal coal fields for obvious reasons. The documentary in place name references evidence is remained, uh, of, and remains of buildings, cinders, burnt brick and pan scale waste 
and rock cut or timber features on the short foreshore. The process was a late medieval development and it has been claimed as a Tyneside development of the 1490s, but the reality looks more complicated as I will come to. There was also a salt refining process where poor quality imported solar salt or rock salt from the Cheshire salt mines was transported coastwise and converted into clean crystalline salt by dissolving it in seawater, settling out the impurities and boiling resultant brine in a pan house. Salt refineries were reasonably widespread around the English coast, especially in the West, but they can be hard to distinguish from pan house works proper. There's also at least four processes used on the near continent, but yet unidentified in Britain, perhaps because we've not known how to look for them. Cellnering involves the burning of salt impregnated peat, leaching salt from ashes, then boiling the resultant strong brine. This seems to have been the main medieval process in the Netherlands, though good descriptions of the field evidence are hard to find. It's not yet been identified in Britain, but what it, perhaps this is a production that took place in, for instance, the Norfolk Broads. And the video link here for this uh, uh, painting uh, in Holland will describe that uh, process for you. The Zostera process involves burning uh, and drying eelgrass. Um, the leach at which the ashes of which are then leached and boiled. Eelgrass is a grass, not a seaweed, which grows underwater on sheltered coasts and desalinates its internal fluids into special cells full of salt. The process was certainly used in eastern Denmark, where eelgrass was also used for thatching and has been claimed in Holland, where it grows in flooded peat distinct, dist diggings for cellnering. Brine graduation is essentially a modification of the partial solar process in which a dilute brine is dripped through a wall or tower of brushwood to concentrate it by evaporation before boiling. Its main use was in Eastern Europe for weak geological brines, but it was used in seawater uh, in Norway. This is a photograph David's taken, I think, in Denmark, um, but you can go and visit this process now uh, for an artisan salt producer in air called Blackthorn salt. Naturally concentrated uh, brines derived from seawater can uh, form by occasional tide flooding uh, over sands and sand beds over impervious uh, bases and plant roots and evaporation extracts pure water, uh, leaving a semi-concentrated brine underground. This is an excavation in Larso uh, in Denmark of the salt houses that made salt by this process. The model I've just sketched is probably a simplification. In practice, each technology is likely to have incorporated variations. Some sites may well have incorporated elements from more than one technology, and the development of one technology from another is unlikely to have been abrupt. There may even have been other processes as well, though I think that eight is quite enough. Turning to my own research, I started um, by doing a desk and record office research to identify potential sites, followed by field work to try and locate and assess the surviving remains. Sometimes, especially for later sites, this involves simply going to a precise known location and seeing what, if anything, survives in visible form and the prospects for below ground survival. At other times, particularly for the early sites, all I have is a reference to a site in a named place which may be, may be no more precise than a parish or a township. My research is geared towards medieval and later sites, but we do have uh, Iron Age sites, um, one at Street House Loftus in North Yorkshire, uh, which has also now revealed to have earlier origins in the Neolithic, and another just north of Berwick, identified by Bricotage from recent excavations. Both sites are interpreted by the excavators as salt production sites, but the clifftop locations to me are bizarre. A possible alternative inter interpretation is that they were salt consuming sites or using sites, perhaps salting seabirds from the adjacent cliffs. A bricotage derived uh, for, uh, from re refining of poor quality import, imported salt. There's also bricotage evidence for an Iron Age salt trade from the Teesside area, but so far as I know, the process 
and precise sources are not yet known. For the medieval period, my historical evidence comes largely from the 12th to the 13th century, uh, monastic charters specifically, and it's therefore drastically biased towards monastic salt making and also er towards areas where the monastic cartularies survive. For instance, most of the Cumbrian cartularies do survive, whereas those in Galloway house houses do not. On close reading, the cartulary entries are normally grants of pre-existing salt works to the monasteries, and often these seem to be clusters of selenite on areas of estuarine salt marsh being divided up between the monastic houses. There's no evidence for the origin of these salt works, though in Cumbria, where the linguistic history is more complex than in the northeast, the slim evidence of several salt coat place names may point towards the period of Northumbrian domination in the 7th to the 9th centuries. The charters occasionally allow the fuel to be identified, sometimes peat, sometimes wood, but doesn't specify the process. The salt coat name and salt marsh locations do, however, strongly suggest sleaching. In the northwest, the Cumbrian houses had extensive salt interests in Morecambe Bay and other sides of the Solway, both in Melrose and Dunfermline. But also, there were salt works on Burr Marsh on the Cumbrian side of the Solway, granted to them by David I during Cumberland's last period of Scottish control. Alongside most of the Cumberland monasteries, Interestingly, the Cumberland houses did not have any known sultans further south in England, and the only known holding by an English house in Cumberland was at Furness Abbey yeah, at Millen in the Lordship of Copeland, which was initially separate from Cumberland. So Cumberland, or at least its monastic houses, seem to have had closer links across the Solway to Scotland than to Furness or the rest of England. On the east coast, the monastic Selina clusters strongly on an area of estuarine salt marsh, not notably the Tees, Blythe and the Coquette estuaries in England, and the Upper Forth, um, Kinnell, Falkirk, Carses in Scotland. Newminster, Brinkburn and Annick all had salt works on the Coquette estuary, and there was at least one non-monastic salt works, perhaps at Salt Coats on the North Bank. The Tees, Byland, Gisborough and Revo all had Selenite on the Yorkshire bank, as well as the massive Durham Priory salt making on the North Bank. The time was not prominent until the end of the 15th century, and though Tynemouth Priory did have salt works in the Low Lights area, this was probably a suitable terrain for sleaching, uh, one of the few on the time. I'm not yet clear when these salt works moved over to coal as a fuel. David's now put in a series of sites, sides of, of sites that he's visited. Uh, on the east coast, at least, on the English side of the border, the field evidence is broadly what he expected by comparison with Lincolnshire. There are sleeching mounds on Teesside, rather smaller in footprint, but higher than the classic ones on the Lincolnshire uh, sites. To my delight, there's a single classic sleeching mound at Gloucester Hill between Amble and Walkworth, again in Northumberland perhaps the documented Newminster Selenite. At Almouth, there's a group of two or three small sleeching mounds reached from the river by Salter's Lane, with clinkery, probably salt boiling waste eroding out of the riverbank nearby. That's in the picture on the right hand side. And I wonder if this site might be a reused sleeching mound to give high dry ground. It's Clifford Fort, uh, on or close to the site of the Tynemouth Priory, Priory Salt Works, and recent excavations have shown it to be built on a hillock of clean sand. In Cumbria, however, the field evidence looks very different. I've found only two convincing groups of sleeching mounds, and these are tiny compared to the East Coast examples. But there are also sites which have no appreciable sleeching mounds, but they do tend to have some slight ground enhancements and have subtle earthworks that look like settling tanks and filter pits for sleeching works. One of these at uh, Wabberthwaite produced a single shirt of medieval pottery, perhaps 13th century, weathered by a cattle scrape. A Selena is documented here in the 14th century, 
and I'm not sure how to interpret these sites. I do think there are salt works of some sort that even that needs proving. They may mark a, a, a variant of the sleaching process described in Normandy in the 18th century, in which the filtration stage was undertaken out on the tidal flats, perhaps at an above ground temporary or even portable filtering vat. And the surviving field sites are the salt coats on dry land, or there may be evidence for one of the other processes that I mentioned earlier. I'll return to the medieval development of pan houses uh, in my finale. Uh, in Cumbria, some sleaching works did continue until the 18th century. Uh, and even into the early 19th century at Ruthwell in Dumfrieshire. But from the 16th century until the final decline of coastal salt making in the 19th century, coal fueled pan house salt works were the norm. The best surviving examples in Scotland, such as St. Monan's, whose excavation report uh, I showed uh, in an earlier slide, seem to have very few upstanding remains, and we barely started identifying, let alone investigating the industry as a whole. In Cumbria, Cross Canonbury is a well-preserved 18th century panhouse salt works, and possibly a refinery. And there is a timber seawater inlet pipe on the foreshore, as well as the onshore earthworks. And Andrew, or I, will be dealing with that uh, in the uh, third talk in this series. On the foreshore theme at Bank End near Maryport, there's an array of rock cut for foreshore, and cis foreshore cisterns and channels, which I confess I do not understand, but may also have been adapted for perhaps storing shellfish uh, or fish uh, at a later date. Crossing the border, but staying on the west coast at Goldenock, there's a distinctive cluster of small peat fueled penthouses in the Rins of Galloway, though I suspect these had as much to do with laundering of smuggled salt than the coal fueled Irish refineries, thus evading the salt tax, uh, as with bona fide local production. The reverse trade um, was briefly attempted in the 1850s where an anomalous and very short-lived salt refinery was set up in Silleth, which imported uh, Irish rock salt to be refined using Cumbrian coal. This is now underneath a, uh, an active sand dune complex just south of Silleth. In the northeast, the field uh, remains a slight, uh, unless of course I come up with some major unexpected finds in later field work. There appear to be virtually no above ground remains in either South or North Shields from the tie inside industry, which was a massive national producer and polluter from the 16th to the early 18th century, though there has been some development related excavations. Of course, Sunderland also had a substantial salt industry, though not on the South Shields scale. Again, I'm not aware of any surviving field evidence. At Seaton Sluice, there are some remains of the Hartley pans on the headland and what may be the seawater inlet below, which is the slide on the right. At Amble, the owner of the house, which currently occupies the site, seems to have an inordinate love of concrete, uh, though again, what has now been filled in was possibly a seawater inlet tunnel. So at the moment, I'm picking up quite a lot of unrecorded and barely understood sites throughout the area that I'm studying. And I think we're beginning to understand the distribution and range of technologies, which are, of course, closely linked a bit better. In terms of identity, one of my research aims, uh, I'm at the moment, I'm not picking up any major differences between England and Scotland, either for the medieval or the post medieval periods. The Galloway sites are certainly unusual, but they're just as unusual compared to the rest of Scotland as they are in comparison to Cumbria. However, for the medieval sites, I'm picking up what at the moment looks like a consistent difference between East and West Coast, which I'd not expected to see. So far, the big classic sleeching man seem to be confined to the East Coast, at least as far north of Alma. I've not yet done my field work for Southeast Scotland, though I know the salt, close, salt coat place names certainly do continue there. On the west coast, sleeching mounds, if they exist, are tiny, 
and I'm getting these subtle sites, which so far I'm not picking up on the East Coast. So perhaps I'm getting a picture that at least for a coastal activity like salt making, the difference between North Sea and Irish Sea or Atlantic provinces was more important than whether you were identified nationally as English or Scottish. But to finish, I want to return to the gap which I skipped over earlier. The development from a seasonal industry dominated by sleaching on the salt marshes using wood or peat as a fuel and small lead pans moved to a panhouse industry using coal furnaces and massive sheet iron pans, both, both house built, to use a steam engine term, into the structure of the panhouse and running continuously uh, through shift work. The fundamental difference, as perceived at the time, is shown by the use of words, selena and salt coat for sleaching, and perhaps for other open works, patella or pan or salt pans for the panhouse works. In the late 12th century, Greenan in Ayrshire had una selena et una patella, though I'm not sure that patella had its later connotations. The site appears to have been wood fueled. In the mid 13th century at St. Bee's Priory, a Selina in Arrowthwaite, perhaps at Saltham, on the south side of Whitehaven Harbour, was fueled with coal mined from the cliffs. This was a very early use of coal and may indicate developments towards the panhouse process. The probable locations appear unsuitable for sleaching, though the site is called the Selina rather than a patella. The earliest usage of pan as a name that I have yet come across is Le Salt Pan at Wearmouth in the 1440s. And Sunderland certainly had a role in the development of the new technology. However, the first evidence for a real takeoff seems to be at Salt Preston, later Preston Pans, east of Edinburgh in the 1460s, and associated both with a major monastic colliery and with the start of a switch in the focus a fourth side salt making from salt marshes on the upper estuary to the rockier and more fully saline coasts, coastlines further east. Returning to the northeast of England, the well known construction of a large panhouse works at South Shields in the 1490s appears to be the introduction of a fully developed process rather than anything experimental and was very rapidly followed by a shift in focus of the salt industry from the tea salt marshes to the Tyne. It therefore looks as if the development of panhouse salt making took place in both Northern England and Scotland. But the final element of the package, perhaps the development of efficient coal burning furnaces and or the manufacture of large and watertight sheet iron pans probably fell into place in central Scotland in the mid 15th century. I also want to stress the importance that this was probably the first coal fueled industry rather than the occasional use of coal in processes that normally used other fuels. Uh, anywhere, or the first anywhere, at least in the West. I don't know about China though. It also differed fundamentally from the earlier process in that sleaching was a part time summer process integrated into the agricultural cycle, whereas the pan house was a full-time year-round activity that involved substantial capital investment and required shift work. And it seems indigenous development predates the introduction of the charcoal glass furnace into Southern England in the 1490s. It was also a major factor in the early development of the coal in industry. While I wouldn't challenge the conventional view that the Tyneside coal industry developed largely to supply the London market with fuel, it's certainly possible to argue that the initial takeoff of a large scale coal mine mining industry in Scotland in the 15th century, in Sunderland in the 16th century, and Whitehaven in the 17th century was primarily to fuel the panhouse salt industry. And that's where the capital was generated. That was then recycled into the coal industry per se. So panhouse salt making seems to me to be a critical element in what I'm increasingly thinking of as a long industrial revolution going back into the late Middle Ages. Northeast England played an important role in that story along with Scotland, and yet we know so little about it, on which provocative note, I very much hope uh, I will finish and thank Andrew for reading this talk on my behalf.
it's quite an effort to go through all that. <laughs> and I hope that uh, I managed to make sense of what David had put together. Right, shall I just carry straight on um, from that? Um, yeah, I think we're running a bit ahead of time. If anybody did did have any questions, um, but perhaps it might be better to leave that till general discussion at the end. Okay. Okay, I'll um, I'll be talking about, uh, as it says here, the uh, the archaeology of the salt making, the the surface buried and submerged sites um, in Lincolnshire mainly, and uh, and also mainly prehistoric and Roman. So it's going to be a little bit earlier than um, uh, what Andrew was talking about then. Um, so finding these uh, pre-medieval surface sites predominantly in the Fenland is actually not that high tech at all. Um, it relies on uh, plodding the fields. We did it uh, at 30 metre intervals, collecting the finds. Um, salt sites are not really uh, seen, the, the prehistoric and Roman ones on aerial photographs. Um, and uh, what is required, though, is an interpretation and an understanding of the ancient landscapes and uh, the effect of the landscape changes therein. So uh, buried sites depend a lot on luck, someone being around when dikes are cut or deep, uh, there's some sort of deep excavation. Um, submerged sites, they're the ones that, uh, that are pretty much impossible to um, uh, to, to find from our point of view, and we're going to need a lot of help with those. And could I just say at some point, um, I'll be probably talking about Middle Bronze Age being the earliest date for salt making in Britain, uh, but Steve Sherlock has been excavating a Neolithic Sultan in the northeast of England, and I believe Steve is with us, so we might get uh, Steve to say something a little bit uh, about this a little bit later on. Um, so uh, we'll we'll move on from there. Well, as you can see, salt is known to have been made in the county for the best part of three millennia, uh, from the Bronze Age uh, right up until the early 1600s AD. And evidence includes hundreds of sites found during field walking as part of the English Heritage funded Fenland project, and that was back in the 1980s. During uh, that long period of uh, salt making, Lincolnshire has benefited from having the ideal coastline of long tidal creeks, uh, piercing wide salt marshes, and also we've got nearby supplies of fuel, in our case peat, and clay uh, also to make the bricotage, the ceramic material used in the process. Now, before we talk about the archaeology, let's just think for a moment about the product itself and the qualities of it, the qualities of salt. Uh, every animal, including humans, needs salt. Our bodies can't live without it. We need it for maintaining the fluid in our blood cells, uh, to maintain our neuromuscular functions, and that's amongst many, many other uses in our bodies. We cannot live without it. Uh, we see here it talks about a profound symbolic significance. So uh, what does that mean? And uh, let's think about that as we go on. Well, as we can see here, uh, this is November the 4th, 2006, but 2006 AD, uh, pagans were pelted with salt and branded witches. And... Uh, and the owner of a pagan shop said, uh, we've had salt thrown in our faces. And salt is not just uh, important in one country or one part of the world. You can see from all over the world here, salt is uh, important in Finland there, salt in Finnish mythology and folklore, uh, in the Caribbean underneath it, the Yala Ponds, 
Um, in the middle at the bottom is a um, salt festival in Spain. Uh, the sumo wrestler is uh, presenting salt to his god ahead of his bout. And uh, yeah, there's a bit about zombies and witches as well. So uh, what made salt this magic mineral? Why did it become white gold? Why was it sought after? And uh, why was it used so extensively in, in folklore? Well, at one point in uh, prehistory, and no one really knows when, the application of salt to the, uh, the organic material uh, was found to inhibit the growth uh, of bacteria and mold. Uh, basically, it stopped the rot. It preserved things. It stopped flesh rotting and going off. And so it was a preservative and a purifier. And uh, it, it just meant that meat and fish could be kept over winter, um, year round, including bad years. You could plan ahead. Uh, basically, it was a miracle product. Yeah, not only that, but salt could be used for many, many other purposes as it is today. But for prehistoric people, um, these are just some of them. Food seasoning was probably the least important of the lot, but preservative there is important. It was also interestingly used um, as antiseptic and medicine. It was used in trade. Everyone needed it. So um, it was just a key product. So as it says here, um, up to the Neolithic period, people, hunter-gatherers, salt was present in their diet, including from meat and fish. Um, but a change in lifestyle, a change uh, to farming, uh, brought about the need for additional salt intake. Now the map on the left is a distribution of sultans in the Lincolnshire Fens with the Bronze Age and early Middle Iron Age sites at the southwest and then a movement out onto the marshes in the late Iron Age and Roman periods. And as you can see, these are a long way inland from the modern coast. Um, on the right is a LIDAR image of the area. Uh, it's in effect, I guess, a micro topographical map of the Fenland showing the extent of all the past tidal creeks and rivers through time. Uh, the green areas around the coast is later siltland, and that's mainly from post Roman marine flooding. And it is higher than the blue colours further inland. And we know that there are some uh, Roman sultans and settlements buried by these later silts underneath the green. Uh, but it's impossible to know how many and how far they extend. Yeah, on the left is a soil map uh, with a late and post-Roman silting around the coast showing as that lighter blue. And uh, the slightly brighter blue to the south being the peat and the darker blue, the former marshes and remnant creeks. And the creeks are now higher ground um, than when they were active there. It's the material that uh, floods over the banks and uh, is held in suspension and then sort of drops out. So uh, it um, creates those high, uh, those banks that you can see in the middle image um, on, on there. And uh, those high banks are the location of many of the sultans. On the left are the creeks as plotted during the Fenland survey, uh, showing the density of the creeks or former creeks and on the right, um, that same extinct creek picture. Now we're going to uh, look at uh, uh, some bricketage. The, uh, the image top left shows what field walked bricketage looked like, um, except that there is usually hundreds and hundreds of these uh, bricketage fragments on the field surface uh, in the Fenland. They're containers that are, are broken as pedestals, halves and clips. And uh, you can see, uh, get a, an idea from the rest of them what they looked like when they were 
complete. The, the top left is mostly um, containers. In the centre, you can see our early attempts at uh, trying to um, understand the containers and the shapes and we we still believe that the one on the left is okay um, these were named gutter shaped troughs and these belong to the middle iron age and possibly a little bit earlier too um, the other two we're less certain of now partly because of the discovery of the containers yeah, at the bottom left and we'll talk about those more later on um, on the right of the image are examples of pedestals on which the containers stood in the the hearths and the ovens and the clips that held them together on those hearths and ovens and uh, this shows how we think the gutter shaped troughs were made and the distinctive types of pedestals on which they stood in the hearth and see uh, bottom left for a kind of reconstruction drawing of that. Now the lighter colored containers at the back of the image on the left are about the most intact ones that have been found. Um, they were discovered on Ingemel's Beach, just north of Skegness, in 1980, after a storm had washed the sand off the beach. Um, they are narrower and shallower at one end, wider and deeper at the other, and uh, you can see that from the illustrations. And there's also a reconstruction in plan of how they may have been clipped together on the hearth. And uh, the majority of hearths that have been found, which are, of course, quite few, there's been very few excavations, um, they have been found to be rectangular. Uh, hearth on the right is uh, da damaged by animal burrows, um, but yielded an Iron Age radiocarbon date from the charcoal, a, a date of around about 180 to 90 BC. And on the left, uh, as we look, uh, is what we term a settling tank. These are first seen in the very latest part of the Iron Age and into the Roman periods. They're clay lined. Um, they've got two, sometimes three compartments and are situated adjacent to the hearts. And we assume that the brine from the creek or from the natural pools in the marsh, which are also confusingly called pans, um, we assume the brine is bucketed into the compartments of the tank um, where the, it's allowed to settle with the silts and sands that are held in suspension being allowed to drop out and then the clean brine is then bucketed into the containers for boiling. Um, often the am animal damage is extensive as at this site in Helpingham dated to the second century BC and you can see damaged hearths and a slight mound of mainly ashy burnt material. This hearth at Spalding is late Iron Age early Roman. The adjacent settling tanks they yielded radiocarbon dates of between 170 BC and AD 140 but a different date was forthcoming uh, the archaeomagnetic date from the hearth, the last firing of which was 130 to 270 AD. Um, however, the hearth seems to have been reused after the end of salt making, and quite a lot of hammer scale was found in the vicinity. At uh, Chatteris in Cambridgeshire, this hearth or oven dates from the late Iron Age or early Roman periods. You can see they're all quite different. Um, also at Chatteris in the very clay soils, this pit has a reasonably intact container. Um, I know it's broken in many pieces, but uh, much of it can be seen and put together again. So it is a typical rectangular shape as we saw with the containers earlier on. This is the site of a gravel quarry extension at Deep in St. James. The image top right has at the very top, uh, you can see the River Welland, which is the county boundary between Lincolnshire and Cambridgeshire. And top left, you can see the dark spread 
Uh, it's an intact prehistoric soil buried by up to half a metre of river alluvium sometime in the early to middle part of the Iron Age. And the yellow strip that you can see is a bank adjacent to a canalised stream course, which may have brought salt water to the site. We tried to plot the finds, uh, sort of field walking on a prehistoric land surface, uh, but after we reached about 9,000 finds, which is mainly pottery and bricotage, we had to abandon that. And uh, when we finally stripped that off, underneath lay post holes of round buildings, four post structures, and a few halves. The latest dated to around about 600 BC. Uh, sadly, there was nothing that we could definitely say it was associated with salt making. Um, near the canalised stream course, there was a lot of burnt pebbles, which may have been used to heat tidal water and crystallise salt, uh, but there was no proof of that one way or the other. Uh, if you see the pit bottom right, that was the, the best proof we had with some very ashy layers, and you can see, and those ashy layers contained bricotage along with um, some Deverell Rimbury style pottery from the middle to later part of the Bronze Age. Um, very few of these Salton sites have been excavated, but here are a few site plans. Uh, you can see a, a common feature on, uh, on a number of them are the penannular ditches. Now, a functionalist would say that these are for drainage to capture some of the water that would inevitably be slopping around. But there is also the possibility that they were exclusion zones, keeping out anyone who does not have that special gift of turning the ocean into this valuable magic wonder product. And you can see at the top uh, that the middle to later Iron Age sites don't have the settling tanks, but those of the late Iron Age, early Roman, they do. And uh, where they are uh, there, they're situated pretty much adjacent to the hearts. And we'll have a look at uh, a reconstruction of the uh, 2nd century AD site at Morton, which is centre left here. We'll, uh, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, a different character to the other sites. There are no circular ditches, uh, and it resembles in plan only one other site that I know about, so the site somewhere in Norfolk. Um, someone once said that salt was probably made um, just by some shepherdess in her spare time when she was looking after sheep on the marsh, but um, this aims to refute this just by the sheer amount of people um, involved and what we now would call supply chains. Um, the image shows people digging the clay to make the containers and the bricotage, people tending the halves, and from our experimental work with Andrew Fielding, we know that once the half starts up, there is a need to be moving the crystallizing brine from container to container, with the nearest one uh, to the actual heat, unsurprisingly crystallizing the salt first. Uh, but we can also see here, there are peat diggers and people transporting the peat to the site and the salt away from the site. So overall, quite a few people involved and presumably for much of the summer season. Now an aerial photograph of the Morton area on the Lincolnshire Fen with lots to see. Uh, you can't see the Morton Salton site or any of the others that are on this photo. At the top uh, you can see a winding natural creek with a straight watercourse leaving that and heading off the image to the centre left with a farmhouse and yard on top of it. That straight water course is the Bourne Morton Canal and that is of early Roman date. Um, the image has north at the top. Uh, the field to the north of the farmhouse has some linear light marks as do the fields southeast of the farm and towards the bottom centre of the photo. These are peat cuttings. They were probably originally somewhere around two or three metres deep. And on the right hand side of the photograph, you can see that has lighter, siltier soils, and that's due to late or post-Roman marine flooding. Uh, 
the left of the photo is darker and that was formerly peat and the linear peat cuttings they were flooded by this late um, or post-roman incursion which deposited silt in the bases of the peat cuttings and subsequently the peat has been drained so these light linear marks the former peat cuttings are now made up of slight ridges of silt um, and that outlines the former cuttings there so in the center left um, Bourne Morton Canal cut some of these silty bands suggesting it post dates them which of course means that there was an earlier flooding episode as well and to the southeast are more silty bands which probably relate to the late um, post-Roman flooding and they were no doubt associated with the early Roman salt making and the cut peat um, wherever it was from um, almost certainly fired those hogs and ovens at the salt making sites there are also peat cuttings known along the Fen Causeway in Norfolk and uh, Roger Palmer spent a bit of time trying to work out how much peat might have been extracted from these and you can see that uh, uh, there is an awful lot of uh, person hours involved in cutting that amount of peat. Um, this is a LIDAR image showing the complexity of the landscape with multiple creeks from marine incursions and the distribution of Iron Age, which are the yellow uh, dots, the, the Roman sites, um, they all lie around the low-lying PT areas um, and that is the white on the, the bottom left, that is the low ground where the peat has now shrunk. Um, the green on the right is pretty well all post-Roman and medieval flooding and uh, there'll be more LIDAR um, images a little bit later on. The, uh, the image now, the map, shows the distribution of the late Iron Age and Roman sites in the Fenland but we're now going to have a look at the area on the top right of the map, uh, the coastal sites, which are again of that same period, mainly late Iron Age and early Roman. Um, this shows a map by Alistair Strang, um, and that uh, is of the surveying information gathered by Ptolemy and uh, it took place before 122 AD and so Alistair Strang has, has worked on that um, and this is his map. Um, it shows the coast of course and in the centre in uh, you can see the larger letters uh, with the word Albion and just below that on the coast and fitting in well with the distri distribution of the known sites in the same place is the place name Selenae the place of the salt makers. Yeah, when John Leyland uh, visited Skegness in the early 1500s, he was told um, that it was once a great haven town, um, a walled town with a castle, castell. Uh, but the old town is clean, consumed, and eaten up with the sea, and at low waters, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the pier manifest tokens of old buildings. So it indicated it was once a large town, um, all town, and uh, there's no medieval or documentary evidence of a walled town or a castle um, in the area. Um, there is though, uh, much of Skegness, as it says there, was under the um, jurisdiction of the Ingemel's Manor, and uh, the mention of place names Chesterland and Castelland, which sound uh, extremely Roman. So the question is, was this Selenae? This is um, a LIDAR image. Um, it's the distribution of known sites uh, pretty much tying in with the location of Selenae. Uh, you can see there are quite a few here in straight lines and this is because all the sites are buried by up to about two meters of post-Roman silting and therefore the only way we know about them is uh, when excavation takes place such as dike cutting 
or where the pipelines come ashore or where there's a new road. Uh, and it's then, if only there is an archaeologist to hand. And just incidentally, right at the bottom left hand corner, you can see an area of white, which is the start of a larger area of former peat fen, which we could argue uh, served all those sultans in the Selenai area. Um, this is what a site looks like um, on the beach. We're also sites found on the beach, uh, particularly after storms, which tend to remove the sands uh, or in particular high tides. Um, this photo was taken in the 1980s at Ingemel's Beach and shows a typical sultan. And what you can see are the remains of containers, hearths and pedestals. And uh, so it's actually quite similar to what the sites look like um, when you field walk in on the surface. This is what the sultans look like in the section, two sites. Um, on the right, uh, it's the Adelthorpe Bypass, and on the left is a drainage dike, also at Adelthorpe. And we can see clearly the depth of the post-Roman silting burying these, um, these early Roman sites. Um, we don't know where we are in terms of each site, whether this cuts through the centre of, of those little mounds or it just clips an edge, we don't know. But what we can't see is the circular ditches which surround the Fenland sites. Um, but we can see the heaps of um, ashy burnt material and the bricotage. And we believe these sites continue into what is, what is now offshore. And we know that um, some of this coast has been eroded. And we know that bits of bricotage have been um, washed up and collected. Uh, this is uh, very recent and a, a rare view of one of the Ingemel's area sultans exposed ahead of housing development. And the site area is really quite large to our surprise. And uh, if you note the depth of the overburden at the edge of the excavation, and what looks like uh, topsoil is in fact ash and bricotage, typical of the material found in the dike sides. Um, it's a map of the area of Adelthorpe and Ingemels, just north of Skegness. Uh, the area outlined in red on the map on the left uh, is a planning proposal for a fishing lake and caravan park. Um, the area was subject to geophysical survey and the results are there on the right and you can see at least four anomalies. Um, these were buried sites, were hand augured and lots of bricotage fragments come up in the auger. So these were individual Sultan sites. And if you just look back to the map on the left, uh, project that density of sites across the rest of the map, and that would be one big distribution of Sultans. Another map on the left, it shows a complete guess at the Roman coastline and a possible location of Selenae and the wind turbines uh, off Skegness are probably close to the uh, site of the Roman town. Um, just a little thing about uh, salt place names on the left. There's the, the continental ones, including the famous um, Hallstatt. Uh, but we just find it interesting that places in and around the Fens uh, with uh, plenty of Iron Age and uh, early Roman salt making tend to have these hail names and hull names as well. You can see on the, the right hand side um, the medieval names of uh, Frognall and Rippingale and the villages of Great Hail, Little Hail, Helpringham, Helsby all have got late Iron Age uh, early Roman sites in abundance and uh, I, I went down to Camel Drove in Littleport in Cambridgeshire. Somebody asked me if I'd go and have a look at a site in Camel Drove. And I thought, what a wonderful name. And, uh, but, and only later did I find out that it was the area um, where all these salt making sites were in Littleport was uh, called Cam Hale. 
in the medieval period. So um, just a just a little interesting diversion. So what did happen between the third century AD and the Middle Saxon period? Uh, well, first of all, there were significant floods around the coast, not only the Lincolnshire coast, but the, the, the coast of Britain and in fact all around the North Sea. And it must have made things very difficult for um, for the salt makers, uh, but salt somehow must have continued to be made. There are early references to salt making, the Middle Saxon references, quite a few of them along the south coast. Um, and in this one, um, granted a parcel of land on the west bank of the river uh, for salt working. And interestingly, this one is for use in divine services and other daily religious uses. We, we mentioned very early on about um, salt and religious uses. And uh, we know that there was a new way of making salt, um, a method called sand washing. And we know that um, this was in operation by the late Saxon uh, period. We'd found late Saxon pottery on top of the mounds of uh, waste uh, muds at Wrangell and Bicker. Um, but uh, recent work by Oxford Archaeology East at Kings Lynn in Norfolk has resulted in a Middle Saxon date being proved for um, the start of the method there. So it involved um, scraping the muddy foreshores uh, after the, uh, the salty fortnightly spring tides. This was then filtered um, in a system like that on the left and uh, the resultant brine was um, boiled in lead pans. Lead pans had in fact been used from the, from the latest part of the, um, the Roman period. And the interesting way, uh, the interesting thing about this new method is that it left behind um, mounds of this desalinated um, silt that they um, that they dragged up from the foreshore. So there are huge mounds that are visible still. And so we know pretty much exactly where these sites were. This is uh, Hilary Healy's map of Lincolnshire, and it shows the locations of the Saxon and medieval sultans. And the little numbers are um, how many sultans were there were in, used in Doomsday, and you can see the shaded areas. Um, for the Fenland, uh, we go back to LIDAR, and in the southeast, you can see that clump of uh, yellow. And uh, these are the mounds of this desalinated silt, the waste heaps. Um, they're just outside the medieval sea bank. And coming west from that, you can see a line where the green colours are slightly different. And the line is the medieval sea bank and the slightly lighter green is seaward. And the line goes to some more of those mounds near to Spalding. And then there's another group um, to the north in Bicker Haven, which was a, a medieval arm of the sea. And right in the northeast is a line of several miles of mounds. And that's just seaward of that white patch, which we now know is former peat. This is what uh, the mounds look like on the ground. And if you look at the photo top left, believe me, they are massive. Um, they're massive mounds uh, in Fenland terms. And underneath that image is what they look like on the LIDAR. So you can see lots of um, individual mounds. Uh, the image is, uh, the image on the right is of the top of Bickerhaven. And that's that arm of the sea that we talked about with a couple of fairly small streams coming into it. And the villages from bottom left are Donington, Bicker, and to the top right, Swineshead. And the early ones here are furthest from the sea, and these show up as the, the lowest of the mounds. 
and gradually during the medieval period the industry moved south along the haven towards the coast. Uh, very few of these mounds have undergone any excavation at all. This one in Bicker Haven in Quadring Parish, uh, Hilary Healy undertook this um, excavation in the 1960s. The farmer had hired a company to level some of the mounds and when the work was partially done, Hilary recorded remains of a half uh, of a peat stack, a small rectangular structure. Uh, which he identified by post holes and a few pits. So this collection of features was part um, uh, of the Sultan and it was dated to around about 1300 AD. Uh, it was interestingly part way down the mound, indicating that waste silt had continued to be dumped on that mound after these features had gone out of use. So you can see there the, the quite dramatic colours and uh, as I say this is a very, very rare um, excavation of these medieval sites. Um, this is an indication of the height of the mounds. Um, this work is at a place called Saracen's Head near Spalding and it shows uh, levelling of the mounds um, and this was undertaken in 1939. And uh, was part of the war effort. Uh, the lady um, standing there is a well known Lincolnshire folklorist and archaeologist called Ethel Rudkin. And the section is interesting in that it doesn't appear to have any features within it, as far as we can see. Uh, but the planks along the bottom and the reasonably straight section do seem to indicate that some archaeological work was being carried out, um, but we don't know of uh, any results. Um, and interestingly, in Wheeler's book, A History of the Fens of South Lincolnshire, he includes a section on fen mounds, and he noted that even in the 19th century, mounds were being levelled by farmers, as uh, they were uh, difficult to, to farm. Um, and now we come to pretty much to the end of the um, salt industry. There are um, the 1300s, they, they were a kind of significant time for the salt making. Early on, everything was going fine. We were exporting salt all around Europe. Um, but then we, um, we were suddenly taking in some uh, cheaper French imports and of course uh, the Black Death made the, the whole thing about the markets much more difficult, uh, less salt was needed. Um, significant flooding, uh, some occurred in the 1570s um, when, as it says in Marsh Chapel, all the salt coats were utterly destroyed, but um, flooding had been a problem from the, um, well, from the 1200s really onwards. Um, there were cheap imports. Um, as we said, first from the continent, um, and then Scotland and Newcastle, where they could make their own salt. They had coal, and so they had um, a, a huge amount of uh, material they could burn from source. Our, our only um, source was peat, and the, the, those sources were diminishing rapidly. And so there was really a gradual decline um, until the early 1600s when uh, we, we stopped making the coastal salt. And, and it brings to a close our quick look at the history of salt making in Lincolnshire. Um, there's still very much detail to learn, uh, but this is, is a framework on which we can build um, a more detailed picture. And there are a number of publications available uh, about the early salt making. Um, with this one, Mineral from the Marshes, I wanted to outline what we knew about each period in Lincolnshire. So um, it was readily available in one volume. So it's really the only publication in the county which looks at the whole three millennia of salt making. And uh, it's available from the Heritage Trust of Lincolnshire or from the Society of Lincolnshire History and Archaeology. And uh, that's about it. Thank you very, very much for listening.
Right, I think um, Andrew's going to come back in now and uh, I think we're getting towards break time, but I don't know whether we're going to have some questions first. I think Andrew um, um, uh, is going to be... Uh, are we going to have some questions, Andrew? Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, we can have questions. Somebody had put a, a note in the chat um, asking why the Ingemel's pans were clipped together. Yeah, well, I, I think it's just simply um, stabilisation. You know, when um, there were, I, I always think that they must have been fairly precarious anyway in in uh, resting on the various pedestals and i think it's just an extra way of um, stabilizing and make, making sure there's no movement and uh, if in fact they did do what we found we had to do in the experimental work that we did we were we were sort of uh, had little pots and were taking um, salt out of uh, one of them that's furthest away from the fire to bring it closer uh, to the fire for the crystallization then you're actually you, you know you can easily start to to move the whole thing and if if uh, you know if, the, if if it all collapses then obviously it's been a been a waste of time so I think it is just a um, uh, you know it's just a way of, of stabilizing things yeah um, I include the Ingemel's pans in my talk later on this afternoon and I've got a little 3d model of that that might make that more clear. Does anybody else um, have anything? We're 10 minutes um, ahead of schedule. We've got 10 minutes for questions. Um, Um, yeah, there was a, there was a, a question there about um, uh, why they were the shape they were, which um, it, it is a is a difficult one um, to to answer. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I, I think we, we we don't know. I think it must be sort of part of the stabilisation and and the, and how they um, how it was how it with being deeper one end and shallower the other um i think that may have been part of helping them to move the um the, you know the saline solution around in the pans yeah and simon says that uh, droitwich or the west midlands makes the claim to be ptolemy selenae but uh, having lived in cheshire middlewich makes the same claim so tom is your claim stronger than theirs Uh, sorry, I missed that, Andrew. I said Simon Woodywis has said that Droit, um, the West Midlands makes claim on Ptolemy's um, map to be the site of Selenae. But having been lived in Cheshire myself, Middlewich <laughs> makes the same claim. So do you think your claim is stronger than theirs? Um, my claim, yeah, I, I, I really do. No, I know, I know it's one of those things. And um, one of the earliest things I, I um, read about it was that it that I think it says that uh, Selena is in the territory of the Cacciolorni. And I think there was an argument, um, Smith and Reve, I think their argument was that, um, that Lincolnshire is not in the territory of the Cacciolorni, but the Cacciolorni uh, was just south of Lincolnshire. So I, I kind of feel that it's, uh, you know, that we were a lot, lot nearer than, than the West Midlands, but, uh, um i know that it, <laughs> it that won't make any difference i know it's it's very difficult and um to know but that's uh that was the um i think that's 1997 that alistair strang uh in britannia that article where he makes a very strong claim and and at one point he says uh um skegness is uh definitely uh, uh it, the where selena i was so um um yeah i'd like to say take it up with him but <laughs> um but yeah i mean that's um you know you know that that's my feeling but, um but yeah i mean clearly you know clearly the west midlands um has a, a whole uh, 
you know, the, the salt and industry. I mean, we, we're only talking about, um, or I'm only talking about the coastal, the ones, you know. So, uh, yeah, and I'm sure that there's a lot, um, there's a lot to that the West Midlands can add to this story. So, um, Anne Welsh asks, some sites are very easy to assume to be salt making sites from their names. What other words or local names suggest salt making sites, particularly in Cumbria? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, uh. Yeah, I was, I was I was kind of interested in um, uh, it, it. Just worked out well. In fact, Brian Simmons, who uh, used to work um, in Lincolnshire, used to run the Lincolnshire unit. He he was the one that first um, uh, 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 sort of came up with the with the idea that these names, you know, were were salt names. And uh, it is interesting that. Um, you know when when you actually do when you when you when you find a place like Frognall or and you think well you know there there are a lot of uh, Iron Age and Roman salt make, making sites around there it's near it's near Market Deeping and uh, um, it's only when you start to put a bit of history together that you find out that that was actually Frognall uh, was called Frock and Hale you know so so there's actually a lot more. Um, a lot more place names than what uh, what you in initially think and uh, yeah so um, I mean I don't know I mean just put it up there really for for discussion I'd be very interested to know if there are any sort of local medieval place names in you know in Cumbria in the northeast that uh, that have that as well have that kind of element in them and Camel Drove Cam Hale of course Morag Cross made a comment of the social side of salt making um, uh, on a Sunday, uh, missing the sermon in church whilst tending the salt is worth looking at in the 17th century. Uh, the main part of the Presbyterian church service was the preaching of the word. If you miss the sermon, even if you're working uh, at an essential services, uh, excuses were not acceptable around the five salt making villages. Uh, it's an awful lot of the, the social side of um, a cultural side of salt that okay. uh, gets swamped out by everybody talking about um, salt and salary having the same route. Um, but there, there, there's a lot more, uh, I mean, archaeologically, you have the, um, the burials that have salt plates uh, in them where there's salt and bread uh, associated with um, sin eaters and so on. Um, large number of those were found during some of the work on the um, HS2 sites. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot there's a lot to understand yet from that. I mean, that's why I put those those few quotes and things on right at the beginning because you know we were not almost. Um, you know, we must kind of think of that that it's not just um, a product of everyday use that they're actually making. It is something that is a, a bit special that is used in all sorts of um, um, folklore and, and culture and, and certainly religions all around the world as well for the purification aspect of it. So, um, yeah, we in, in, interestingly, we had a... Um, uh, a person working with us for a short time who'd been um, an anthropology student and had gone out to Ethiopia and um, she said that e even now the the blacksmiths are regarded as you know kind of shaman a bit a bit special and uh, that she said that you know she was horrified that the no one in the village would would even consider marrying the daughter of a blacksmith because they were regarded as you know they they were the person that turned the earth into weapons and they were a bit uh, a bit special well you know I, I kind of made a, a bit of a play for salt makers to be regarded as a bit special as well i mean it may well have been a uh, you know family units working together but uh, you know i'd like to think that um you know that they were regarded as being 
you know, quite, uh, you know, that they, they took the ocean and made it into this magic wonder product. Um, Morag Cross also says she's working on sites at Portobello um, in Scotland and that the, um, the link between the estates having collieries and salt pans goes together. That happens in Cumbria as well. The Cross Cannonby site is there because the owner had um, early uh, salt works in the 16th century and they were using their local salt uh, to, to kind of fuel their own industry. But she also makes the connection um, with uh, the supply of salt herring to slave plantations in Jamaica and the West Indies. Um, and salt was uh, a major contributor to feeding slaves. Um, there was a big link between salt fish and feeding slaves on ships <coughs> going out to the West Indies. So you get the kind of salt going from, um, from Cheshire to ports like Grimsby and salting cod, and then that was used in the slave trade. Yeah, we we had medieval references of um, of salt going down to Yarmouth and um, salt for the herring um, and salted herrings being brought back by the same ships and that as well. Yeah. Steve's left a message about Street House. Uh, yeah. which hopefully we can just discuss at greater length um, in the Q&A at the end. But he's got evidence for irregularly shaped vessels as well um, in uh, the Neolithic sites he's excavated. Right, yeah, that'd be good. Be good to hear about that. Uh, can you hear me now? Hi, Steve, yeah. Hi there, yeah, I put two comments in. Uh, earlier on I said I wasn't uh, a great believer of David's, David's assumption that we were just consuming salt, uh, certainly in the Iron Age, based on having vessels, props, halves and, and everything. And then I'm, I'll go on to say later on that there's more evidence for salt. If they weren't making salt work, salt uh, street out in the Neil, where on earth were they? There is a tremendous amount of evidence for it on an industrial scale, but that's another lecture in itself. They're clearly making salt at street house in the Neolithic. Yeah, I think I think that's exciting. Yeah, we'll, we'll love to hear more about that a bit later on. I mean, people still get worried, don't they, Steve, about the fact that you're at the top of a cliff. Um, and what they don't really realise is actually work, actually making salt on a beach uh, where the high tide might lap up against the foot of the cliff makes it an almost impossible um, thing to do. And you want to be up where your village is and where everything can be safe and secure. Um, so that making something that nobody else is making uh, the extra, extra extra effort in carrying anything up a cliff to somewhere safe is well worthwhile. Indeed, if you look at Kimberidge, Green Down, uh, also the sites in Cornwall and on the beach, the upper cliff, you look at salt making at Cobham, and granted it's not on the cliff, but it's about two kilometres inland from the water, so they're clearly transporting the, the liquor in to, to, the, to the point where they want to be manufacturing it. Uh, there's obviously other functional reasons. I see that at Street House, they're doing it there because they can get the, the material dry. It's not just a question of put, setting fire to it. And there's all the kindling at the bottom of the cliff is obviously fairly well damp, but you've got a good drying wind and then you're storing it in a drier environment so it doesn't return back to being a moist, damp product that you can't use. So there's, uh, I'm very functionalist about this, but I'm not afraid of sending some of the uh, members of the, the village down, down to the bottom of the cliff to go and bring some water up. So that's an evaporated solution. But that's more later. That's, uh... Yeah. Good. We're just coming up now to um, 25 past three. Um, so we're scheduled to have a quarter of an hour break. Um, so I will put um, a timer on the screen and we'll come back at 3.40 um, and I will run through some of the work I've been doing to try and reconstruct some of these different salt making processes. Thank you very much. 
are we doing Alex shall we ready to start uh, yeah I think it's okay to get started right I'll put my screen find find my talk uh. Oh, you just need to double click on it again, Andrew, like before. Should I cancel the um, the screen break one? Yes. Yeah, the moment we've got your desktop again, rather than the there PowerPoint presentation. Are we there now? Uh, not quite. <laughs> I don't know what you did last time, whether you double clicked and opened up the PowerPoint presentation. That's it, yeah. No, let's go back. Sure. <clears throat> that That's one. good. Yeah. Great. Not too many things to choose from. <clears throat> it's also quite a large PowerPoint, this one. It takes a bit to operate because it's got some videos locked into it. Okay, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start um, my talk with just a consideration for um, the art of salt making and then just quickly show the practical work that I've done in the past uh, before moving on to um, the, the digital reconstructions that I've started. Um, in 1748, in his paper on the art of making common salt, Brownrigg stated that for all the notice that had been taken of salt making, after the practice of so many ages and art so simple and withal so necessary hath not yet been brought to any degree of perfection. Um, and himself and John Collins and Lowndes were essentially talking about making salt for the fishing industry, um, but um, they take into account all of the methods uh, of making salt up to the dates that they were writing about. In Northwich in 1933, um, a paper given by Mr. Parker uh, in Winsford quoted a former managing director of Salt Union Limited uh, in Northwich that he gave to the Rotarians. He said that when speaking of the old salt pans, when he first came to work for the salt union, he thought here is plenty of room for improvement, but it was not very long before he discovered he'd made a great mistake and that it was an amazingly efficient evaporator. I've reprinted the whole of that article in the newsletter uh, number six that you can download from our website. And so we can consider the Lion Salt Works that closed in 1986 as the pinnacle of the open pan salt making. And one of the research reports I wrote for the um, Lion Salt Works Trust, and it was edited by my, my wife, Annelise, uh, published memoirs of Tom Lightfoot, who'd worked in Middlewich. And he was encouraged to write his history uh, of the industry. Uh, he worked for Hamlet Saltworks in Winsford, Henry Seddons and Murgatroyds in Middlewich. Um, and he produced a set of diagrams about how the salt pans worked that he operated in. Um, and uh, we can compare that with the ones for Lion Saltworks. And one of the differences is that the, uh, the chimney for the works he worked in was in the centre of the works rather than be set at one end. And one of the important things for making the type of salt they made was a dead draft 
where there was no heat to the side of the pan when they were raking the salt out of the salt pan uh, to make into blocks or into salt. But the other thing we've got to remember with lion salt works, um, yes, it survived, um, but it was built and it was built by one family. But between um, the 1890s and the 1980s, four different generations uh, of the Thompson family uh, operated this works and successively built new salt pans as each generation took over from its predecessor. And the different colored uh, things here is a 3D model that I built with Julian Baum uh, of Tate 27 that was produced from a CAD drawing that was taken from one of the first laser scans that English Heritage paid for as a proper record of a historic monument uh, by Tony Rogers at APR Services. So the red salt works in the top left uh, it, it is the first salt pan. And then the blue one is the second, the yellow one's the third, pan house number four is green, and Henry Lloyd Thompson, the last of the generation, he actually built the orange salt pan in 1960. And it's identical to the first one that was built in the 1890s. But by um, the 1900s, the vacuum uh, process that had been adopted from the sugar industry uh, was taking over um, the process of evaporating brine by using even less fuel than an open pan salt works in Northwich or Winsford could do. And from the 1900s, they themselves um, moved on from single evaporation units to multiple effect evaporators, um, where the, um, uh, the, the brine was progressively boiled uh, in a sequence of chambers at an ever reducing pressure and used ever reducing amounts of energy or heat uh, to make the salt. And so from the Middlewich um, British salt works, going right the way back to Steve Sherlock's um, excavations of his Neolithic salt making site at Lofthouse, we've got uh, 6,000 years in which people have been evaporating a liquid, a brine, to make a white solid. And over those 6,000 years, the physics and the chemistry of making salt hasn't changed. But the process by which that change took place uh, has changed uh, enormously. But very often at multiple places in multiple time, <coughs> it's operating completely different um, systems. Even today, where there's a growth in artisan sea salt, um, we can uh, buy table salt or crystal salt uh, for <coughs> our tables that's either been made uh, on a plastic sheet in a polytunnel, um, has been made by dripping brine down a graduation tower in air in Scotland, uh, or by heated by gas or electricity or heat lamps uh, in an open pan. So lots of variation in lots of ways. And the Lion Salt Works also shows us um, the, uh, the wider group of associated buildings that are essential to the operation, such as brine pumps, brine storage, engine house in their case, a smithy, a manager's office. So it's not just a furnace and a salt pan that we knew need to be looking for. Um, what also changed was that when in Northwich, they were no longer they're no longer pumping from uh, a wild brine that led to the chronic instability and pollution uh, around the Cheshire area. Um, so a quick summary of the processes. We've got a solar process, a partial solar, sand washing and sleaching that itself can take uh, different processes, foreshore uh, process, a mound process, a sand pit process, an enclosed bed process. We've got graduation towers, by dripping uh, brine through things. We've got a direct boil boiling, graduated boiling, uh, refineries involving salt on salt or uh, putting rock salt into something, and then vacuum evaporation. Salt pans consist of uh, salinas on the foreshore. They're ceramic pans, lead pans, iron pans, stainless steel pans, plastic sheeting. And the heat that's been used is the sun and the wind, heat, wood, coal, and in some cases, a secondary heating source, such as in Ireland, uh, where salt pans were put over the top of lime kilns. So you're using the waste heat from lime burning uh, to evaporate brine. Or in Middlesbrough, where the ironworks took waste, uh, sent waste heat to the underneath 
uh, of a salt pan to evaporate that. But up until rock salt was found in the 1670s and into the 1700s, uh, most brine was a seawater strength brine or a weak inland brine that needed pre-concentrating uh, either a lot of energy to boil it directly, or it had to be mixed in with other salts, or it had to be pre-saturated uh, using uh, solar. Once you got the saturated solution, uh, you could then make white salt crystals. And from 1670, salt refineries were taking rock salt to dissolve in seawater or fresh water to make white salt. And then of course the modern uh, rock salt is used for de-icing the road. But then again, what do we mean by salt? Uh, do you mean fine salt, coarse salt, common salt, fishery salt, dairy salt, dirty salt, white salt, crystal, stove, lump block, dendritic, uh, blaze, bay salt, fleur, fleur de sel? Uh, if you're making salt in Cheshire and you're exporting it, it takes the name of the destination it's going to. So for the fishing industry in Canada, it's Halifax salt. Um, for places in Nigeria, it's called Lagos salt. If it's exported from Liverpool and goes to America, they call it Liverpool salt, even if it's been made in Cheshire. Table salt's different from cooking salt, kosher salt. PDV is the pure dried vacuum that you get from a vacuum salt works. Uh, and then you've got uh, anti-caking agents that go into things uh, in the modern process. There's a whole raft of filters that we need to consider, just talking about what type of salt and where it comes from. While I was at the Lion Salt Works, um, I had the opportunity to um, talk with both Henry Lloyd Thompson, the last owner, with Richard Hamlet of the Hamlet Salt Works in Winsford, who was the chairman of our trustee. And um, I was able to have the luxury of time and space around the salt works to make um, ceramic pans. The one here is the uh, Ingemel's pan that Tom was talking about, made replica lead pans and made a replica of an iron pan. We'll come back and look at the Ingemel one later, and we'll also look at the Day Ray Metallica one later on as well. I made a Selena in my garden uh, when I had a house on Anglesey by collecting seawater and placing seawater in eight trays, leaving it in the sun in August to concentrate 50% down to put in four trays, moving the concentrated brine from that when it had reduced by 50% again into two trays and again into a single tray to make salt crystals at the end. It takes 35 litres to increase the concentration from 2% to 16% and then get up to your white salt crystals. I even brought over Jill's Virgils from um, the Gottesgarber Salt Works in Rheine in Germany. And we built a replica graduation tower of our own uh, using blackthorn twigs from the local nature reserve. There are various things of these that you can see on uh, my YouTube channel. And it's said to be a very simple process. And in 1594, uh, Hugh Platt wrote that in days of want, every poor man dwelling by the seaside could try in what sunny days to make a sufficient store of salt for his individual consumption by filling basins, dripping pans or any other empty and shallow vessels with seawater and setting them in the sun in hot sand in high places. So if you're short of salt, you nip down the sea and you take a saucer of it, put it on your windowsill and you can make salt. And I've moved on now from the practical um, sides uh, of salt making. Um, and once you no longer have the space and the luxury of somebody else's backyard to put all these things in, it's a bit difficult what, to build one purely in your own garden. So I started working uh, on uh, making digital models uh, from the uh, raw um, uh, data sets in terms of documentation, photographs, um, uh, uh, and archaeological excavations. Um, I've been using um, SketchUp because when I started it was uh, a Google thing and it was free and um, now I use the uh, not-for-profit version that I can get as part of EcoCell UK. So once all these models and sites are processed it should be possible at the end to simulate the operation of each of, the, of them in a standardized way. In parallel, 
uh, I've been trying to write uh, an interactive iBook so that I can link um, the uh, uh, source material with the uh, 3D models, um, uh, be that a documentary account, a picture or an archaeological excavation, and set that into a timeline. I've also um, taken the sites that I've been looking at and put them onto a Google map uh, with different filtering systems so that you can look at the, the balloons and the sites um, and they're split up to doomsday, historic, artisan salt makers, industrial salt works, lidos, um, salt history, uh, salt houses, people, churches, museums, food, music, salt marshes, wrecks with cargoes of salt in them, uh, salt glazed potter, potters and works of art. Um, uh, uh, building the, the whole um, record of salt making within the country. Um, for this presentation, um, I'm going to admit um, sites from Ireland, but refer you to Wes Forsyth's project looking at the archaeology of salt production in post medieval Ireland and the work of uh, Joanne Handley and the Skate Trust in Scotland, uh, in particular at the UK. YouTube record of the Scottish Salt Symposium that was held in 2021, at which myself and Tom Lane uh, contributed talks. And I'm now going to briefly visit the sites that I've listed, listed on the right hand side. Um, I could talk about each of these for more than an hour each, um, but necessarily today well, I'm going to be very brief or you'd be here for another 14 hours. So this is one of the first um, reconstructions that I made uh, in collaboration with Tom Lane at the Ingemeld salt pans um, because we wanted to try and come up with a solution about why these lozenge shaped pans were deeper at the wide end, shallower at the shallow end and why they got staining patterns showing that they'd been clay, plip, clay uh, clips locking them all together. And we came up the, with the, the, the idea that actually each individual pan uh, wasn't itself making salt. It was part of a unit that concentrated brine and that the deeper end of the pans were to enable you to ladle brine out from one pan into the next and that you could graduate the heat uh, within uh, these furnaces so that you weren't putting cold brine into a hot salt pan. So the cooler end, you put the raw brine in to start with, and then as it evaporated, uh, as I described in my Selena in the garden, um, you moved a little bit of concentrated brine into the next salt. So you ended up with a group of crystallizer pans uh, and one or two, sorry, you ended up with a group of concentrator pans uh, that you baled brine into crystallizer pans from which you took salt out. So it was a continuous process of salt making. And as Tom said, in the early days, people thought this was something you just set up and you made some salt. But quite obviously, this process is something that you set up and you operated over a long period of time. Um, and um, my little model here shows how the paths were built up with a firebox with a perforated floor probably uh, held there and that salt pans were held on clay pedestals of which damp balls of clay were placed on the top. And you then pressed your salt pans in the top to actually the balls and wet balls of clay enable you to level your salt pans up. And then during the first firing, um, the clay balls would actually harden into fired clay, as would the clips that you put on to lock the salt pans together. So there's an element of each individual component being put together locked in place so that it couldn't move and then you fill it up with brine and then you move the brine along the salt pan and take crystals out from the far end. So it's one of the more sophisticated um, systems um, but it does make you think of whether individual uh, clay pans that didn't actually have the furnace operated uh, in a similar way. Um, we then went up, because I was working with Tom in Lincolnshire, um, and he took us round a tour of some of the um, sleeching sites, the most uh, spectacular ones um, with these crescent shaped waste deposits, completely different to the uh, large mounds that he's got in other parts 
was excavated um, in 1994, published in 1994 in Medark. Uh, by McAvoy and Healy. And um, I actually reconstructed their excavation report to show the uh, filtration units, the brine collection pits, and uh, the uh, inlet uh, pipes that brought the seawater in uh, to, the, to the site. And Brownrigg uh, in the 18th century says, um, but not far distant from the Salter and on the seashore between the full sea and low water marks, they make ponds in rocks and stones in the sand, which they call a sump. And from this pond, they lay a pipe through which when the tide is in, the seawater runs into a well adjacent to the Salter. So the tide is coming in a long way to uh, the, the seaward side of this and the salt works is well land. So here's the plan and the cross section of um, these structures. And these are all of the reproduced um, paths uh, and filtration units. And um, the, uh, they're set so that um, the brine is collected uh, through this pipe that is running under the sand to these large grey collection chambers and then it's carried through to the filtration units where it's um, put in or, or possibly taken to the other side to, to add seawater to uh, make a sleach that the sand is then brought into these uh, collection things uh, and water is run through it to collect a saturated brine. And this process still goes on today. Um, Andrea Jankowski has a whole series of videos looking uh, as an anthropologist at salt making processes. Um, and uh, in the center of Thailand, um, these are two people actually making uh, almost exact replica of the 16th century archeological site that was excavated at Wayne Beach St. Mary. She's also got uh, other things. She's got a grant now from the British Museum uh, to look at a, a, a site that is like Selnering um, in the Philippines, um, where instead of using um, salt water um, saturated peat, um, they use coconut husks and saturate them in seawater over a six month period before burning the dried saturated or impregnated uh, coconut husks and then uh, sleaching the uh, salt out from the ashes and that's a process that's been going on until very very recently. And then De Re Metallica, um, the, there's a whole series uh, of engravings um, the one on the top row on the right hand side uh, is probably the one that is used um, as an iconic uh, reproduction of what a 16th century salt works looks like and as I go through the others perhaps we'll challenge whether this is actually what uh, is typical of a 16th century salt work site in the UK. Um, but he runs through all of the other different processes uh, in the line drawings to the right that don't get as widely published. And um, I've taken the line drawings, cut out all the relevant bits so that I could have a walkthrough of Agricola's landscape with the various salt houses, the carrying of the brine uh, in the buckets to the salt hearths, um, the tank for holding the brine in, this is the salt master's wife who he uses if he hasn't got an assistant, and the um, hooks and staples um, that support the small um, pl plates that make up the salt um, bundles of faggots here and the furnace could be adapted uh, by making it deeper to burn bundles of uh, straw rather than bundles of firewood. But it's part of uh, perhaps being able to use um, the animations to tell the story of salt making rather than just focus specifically uh, on one aspect uh, or just talk about the furnaces. These are operational units and the whole thing needs to be explained together. Um, but then of this drawing that we see uh, in lots of people's illustrations, um, that 
we always show this one with a rectangular pattern. But if you look at contemporary ones in France, um, these can be oval or round. You can see the one on the right um, has got staples, it's got uh, bulks of timber holding the staples up. There'll be um, uh, put staples on the underside of these small uh, iron pans to stop the whole thing from um, melting, dropping down as it's heated into the furnace. We've got uh, a pond that's collected the brine. We've got a bucket and sweep to lift the brine out of the well, bundles of faggots uh, being thrown under the salt pan. And again, we'll see this um, reproduced in another uh, of the UK works uh, in a minute. Contemporary with that, 1566, um, there's a diagram uh, drawn by John Mount uh, where he's describing a salt works that he's proposing to build at Blythe in Northumberland, and he's going to use coal rather than wood. And you can see that oval shape at the top of the furnace, perhaps indicating that his um, salt pan is not going to be rectangular, but it's going to be like the, the ones which um, we saw from the French illustration. And we've got two salt pans side by side, and there is a central space in which the fuel is going to be put so that one person could stoke all four salt pans, perhaps, uh, making it economical uh, on labour and perhaps more efficient. In 1567, Mount, while Mount was looking at uh, setting up salt works on the east and the south coast of the country, um, those are works proposed at the manor of Geneglen uh, on the uh, Dovey. Uh, River Dovey opposite um, Ava Dovey, um, somewhere within uh, the peatlands of the Cause Fochno. Um, and the documents for this uh, were published um, and have been repeated by Hughes in 1935, Lloyd in 1954, and in the catalogue of the papers by Smith in 1960. And it describes the sea that must be taken into at every high tide and received into a store pond, which must be, must be drained at low tide and after foul weather. And between the store pond and the house, there must be 12 to 15 acres of marsh cut into ponds, 20 to 24 foot square, half a foot deep. And the water is to lie a time and be enriched by the sun and then led by a sluice, sluice to a saver pond hard by the house. And if you go through all of these letters, it's actually um, a project planning document as a series of letters uh, in which they set out the design in February. They test the water samples and they do ground testing to show that the water can actually doesn't soak right the way through the ground uh, in the March. And they're proposing to have this works operational by the 1st of May, though they don't achieve it until the end of May. Um, all of the uh, elements are manufactured and delivered in the green sections, they're constructed in the blue sections and salt making starts uh, towards the end of May and operates for two or three years. Um, so it's not, it describes a whole series of, of uh, things that they have to encounter uh, and overcome. One is where they're going to get salt pans from because uh, initially they wanted cast pans but they couldn't get them so they had to be made in Sussex and then they were going to deliver them by over, overland sorry, sorry. to Bristol uh, or they were going to carry them overland uh, to Shrewsbury and carry them from there to Aberdovey. In the end they were put on a ship and taken from London all the way around the south coast uh, to be delivered and we can look at the various different people that were involved in this, William Whiteman, Peter Osborne, um, but the part of the, they were to implement the uh, salt works. Christopher Schultz was a German who'd been brought in and was employed in the company of minerals and battery works. Um, and Mount, who we've seen uh, sent the document back from Blythe, he was working as clerk to Lord Burley and also setting up works uh, in um, Suffolk, Kent, Southampton, and Sussex, but he was using a Frenchman who was skilled in setting pipes and conveying water 
to actually set these works up for him on the coast. So where was this salt works? Um, because even though they've done um, a wetland survey around the peatlands, um, they didn't really they look at where the salt works might be. Uh, it's just in a, an appendix uh, because it's in the heritage environment record. Um, the yellow uh, square there represents 15 acres to the scale of the map, but the actual salt works has to be along either that north coast, the south side uh, of the Dovey, or it has to be along the Irish Sea. Um, it may be that it's been obliterated by later peat cuttings, um, but it was quite a sizable thing. Um, they got a building that held 10 pickle pans and two salt pans with salt stores on either side. They had to bring in all of the equipment for building it, wheelbarrow, mattock, spades, shovels, and 800 weighing loads of firewood had to be there for when it was constructed. Um, there's perhaps a reason why salt works are described as a destroyer of forests. It had uh, a a mound around the salt works uh, that was made from the earth that was excavated from the uh, partial solar pits that were dug by 93 men. Uh, and it had a saver pond and a, a, a source pond that we saw from dogs. The pans had been shipped uh, either in halves or quarters that were then to be erected uh, in the furnaces. This is just my initial interpretation about how that was set up. Here's a bucket and sweep that we saw in that French engraving, lifting brine up uh, from a well or a pond to go to the salt works. But these, these uh, evaporation ponds are only six inches deep. So whether or not um, it's really possible to try and locate these are today. I really don't know. But I don't think anybody's really looked. In 1631, a salt works were set up at Whitehaven Pier. Uh, it was 80 foot by 60 feet. Um, this uh, set of drawings was published in 1975 um, in the Colchester Archaeology Group's uh, Salt, the Study of an Ancient Industry. And it was also used by Blake Tyson, who looked at the accounts in 1999. Um, and everybody just says, this is a salt works, but what did that look like? Um, so we've got some salt pans that are there in pink. Uh, we've got a blue storage reservoir for seawater. And the light pink one is actually labeled for bay salt. So it's likely that this is using a salt on salt process. And that there are three mixing tanks uh, connected by pipework that's shown in yellow um, for putting the seawater into the middle tank, mixing that with uh, bay salt, um, letting that go down into another mixing tank before being pumped up to a distribution tank that was set up uh, at a higher level. And this is my schematic as to how that drawing might be interpreted. But we perhaps could be more precise um, by looking at the uh, Henrik Schickard's drawing of 1595, showing how these furnaces were set up uh, that he'd recorded. And I'd use the similar arrangements of sluices to put into the Abbey Dovey document that you've just seen. The bay on the left-hand side is for the white salt to be stored in before it's shipped out. Um, Brereton um, travelled to Holland, uh, the provinces, uh, England, Scotland and Ireland. And in 1635, he went to South Shields and describes a number of salt pans there. One of which, uh, the, these that I've reproduced here, 24 pans with only 12 furnaces and 12 fires erected uh, all being square and of light proportion, placed by two and two together, one against the other, the six pans in the highest rank, the bottom equal with the top of the lower. This is set up similar to that Ingmail's pan, where you put your seawater into the top pan over the top of your hot fire, 
you evaporate that down and keep adding more salt water. And as it strengthens, you feed it into the lower pan, which is taking the waste heat from the concentrator pan. Uh, and then the fumes are going up the chimney and you're taking your salt out of that second lower pan. And you've got ranks of chimneys set up back to back. And there are also some places where you can put some brine between the furnaces, which are hot uh, to make a different kind of salt. There are dampers in the chimneys to regulate the flow of hot air uh, out of the uh, furnaces and up the chimney. Um, 1675-1700, we've got a couple of uh, partial solar works that are described. The Royal Society, when it was set up, spent a lot of time uh, looking at salt works. I haven't included a lot of those in this talk because it takes uh, too long to go through. Um, but Robert, Robert uh, Hook was a curator of experiments, and this is his description of a partial solar works with collecting uh, uh, Selena uh, salt pans a um, bit more perhaps robust than the ones we saw at Aberduffy, feeding into a uh, saver pan that was then uh, allowed through a pump um, that saturated brine to go up into a header tank and fed down into the salt pan. And there's a conical basket for you to put your uh, wet salt in to drain out to make a cone of salt. Again, we'll see that uh, in another salt works later. Um, in fact, in this one, um, this is reproduced in the newsletter uh, that we published last year um, that is available for you to download from the Shed um, uh, software. And um, it was um, uh, a record that was made um, in 1697 and the documents were then found by Richard Fenton and published um, in the Cambrian Archaeology Society by John Fisher in 1917, um, when because of the First World War, they couldn't go any fit on any field trips and he went through the archive and looked at things that he could actually put into a publication. And this is quite bizarre because uh, you take your seawater and put it into a vat, and then you have three fires placed triangularly at equal distances. And from each fire, a mortar piece or an iron pipe resembling the piece of cannon uh, towards the tub, conveying the heat and boiling uh, that with a coal fire till it, uh, by tasting, they find it sufficiently salt. And then, let's look at this, we've got three fires, we've got pipes going into the seawater, and then having concentrated that down, you then put uh, your concentrated seawater into lead salt pans, and then you put your white salt into a cone, uh, and dried it off, let it drip, uh, and puts it into what he describes as a bin, fashioned like the inside of a roof, which have a conveyance at the bottom for the liquor to run out. Uh, vessels on the outside to receive it, as is used to make cider. Um, and um, the, the person that was uh, giving the guided tours for this comes from Watch It, in Somerset. Um, they're obviously using local coal from the Swansea area, um, but possibly Mr. Uh, Thomas uh, of Somerset, uh, that's where the, uh, the lead salt pans and the metalwork came from. And uh, looking on um, the um, mapping evidence and going through um, the Tithe maps, um, they're in an area by Ogmore uh, by sea, uh, not far from Carmarthen, uh, where this record was supposed to have been collected, or in the region of Carmarthen where it was collected. Uh, there is a field called Salt Field, and there is an inlet called Bulk Cairhallen, Hallen being Welsh for salt. Um, and I'd like to think that somewhere in that field it's possible uh, that Ms. Mr. Cox's salt uh, works could be found. And we started off with brown rig, um, and people still use brown rig's um, illustration of his version of Agricola uh, about being contemporary. But this is his um, 18th century salt works, which is a lot more industrial uh, than Agricola's. 
We've still got opposing um, salt furnaces, so you can have your coal in the middle and your fireman can be filling um, the, uh, uh, firing the furnaces from both sides. But we actually have a, um, an iron pan set up uh, over the furnaces chimney there on the outside uh, wall of that, there is a uh, seawater um, tank, which is set up higher so it can feed the salt pans by gravity. Uh, and it's pumped up uh, from an underground pipe uh, that comes in from the sea. Um, there's a lot of infrastructure uh, that is possible to uh, interpret as well. This is the up which uh, Brian well, um, published by uh, Derek Hurst, um, and I've taken the uh, publication documents to reproduce from their drawings what this well would have looked like. This is just my first stage uh, interpretation. I haven't got any of the pipes or any of the ladders uh, fully in place. But you can, you can start to actually then link that to um, the salt pan houses. Um, that surrounded this uh, in Upwich. This is the uh, 16th century map of that area showing the um, salt pans um, around uh, this brine well. The location uh, of all of our coastal sites, um, as David's mentioned and Tom, um, are all described really as being the head of creeks and lagoons and estuaries. And so I just want to move on to some of these locations and just talk about where and why they're located there. Um, uh, and we'll, we've already talked to Steve about why it's more beneficial to have them on the top of a cliff than uh, at, at somewhere where they could be eroded at, at the bottom of the cliff. Um, so we've got um, the little dots around Morecambe uh, Bay um, between Silleth and Carlisle. And all of the, uh, the red dots are set on the high, the top of the high marsh in the same way that they are around this area, around the wash. Um, so the tide comes in uh, and goes out and you're at the head uh, of a, a river, such as the Adur Valley, uh, where actually setting things up on the coastline uh, would have been quite precarious. Um, and so not only was we look at the buildings themselves about the furnaces and how they're operated, but how they actually derive their fuel, uh, their, their, their salt water. So the tidal ranges are really important, particularly with some of the um, sand washing processes where you're looking to trap the water at the high spring tides. Um, and you'd be amazed how many times when I give these talks to the general public, people still think that a spring tide happens in the spring uh, rather than monthly, um, or they still think that perhaps the high tide is at dawn when the ships leave port because they've watched films where people leave on the dawn tide. Um, so they forget that this is something that alters um, throughout the day, it's an hour difference each day, and you've got high springs and you've got low neaps. But also you've got a tidal flow to consider. So on the, um, the coast around Cross Cannon Bay, it's fairly even. Tide comes in and goes out, comes in and goes out in a steady flow. But where there's a constriction at Cardon Point here, uh, as it enters the upper end of the uh, Solway, you have a tidal bore. So you have an inflow of water that comes in very quickly and then the tide uh, goes out very slowly. And where you're looking to try and concentrate and dry silts and sands at high spring tide, uh, so you've got to have that right type of sand above the level of the tide where it's only going to get covered once a month. Um, and you're going to um, really want that to be on a regular basis. You don't want it to all be washed away. So the location and the tidal flow is really important when considering these sites. And of course, all of them are, are really um, subject to coastal erosion. Tom's has got a lot that you can't see because they're covered in sediments and alluviums that are built up, but the vast majority of them are now suffering uh, from coastal erosion, um, perhaps climate change. So it's not just the castles, um, historic England, English heritage, 
It's all of these things that need to be taken into account. Two of them on the left-hand side, Port Ironen in Glamorgan and Cross Canonby in Cumberland, uh, the only ones that I know that have actually been protected. Uh, Cross Canonby's got uh, stone-filled gabions uh, protecting it. We'll see that later. Port ironen has got a, a brick um, a lined um, embankment uh, protecting it on all sides. But um, St. Monan's uh, is now eroding uh, quite heavily. And things like the Roman sites at Trevava uh, in Cornwall uh, are literally falling into the sea on a daily, monthly basis. Um, the Scape Trust excavated their site at Brora um, because the Ginnell, the one the photograph at the top right, um, has uh, was eroding and has now been completely, after the, after the excavation is completed, uh, has now been completely uh, washed away. But the original pan house to that kennel uh, was farther out to sea, as was the saltwater cisterns. <coughs> and they were eroded a long time ago. Uh, and it, even in local papers, they were described as having been revealed by storm action uh, of salt making sites uh, that had previously been lost. And um, St Andrews has reconstructed um, some of the buildings on their open virtual world sites. Um, I'll just go to St Monan's briefly because it still has the windmill that brought the uh, brine up from the uh, wooden pipe that leads underground from two um, collection tanks uh, out to sea. So the seawater is collected at high tide in those tanks. It flows down the pipe uh, and then is lifted up uh, by a pumping engine from the, the wind pump into a tank from where it could be distributed down to the salt pans by gravity. Uh, and I'm suggesting, uh, and I think Colin Martin suggested also that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the light green here is actually where the, uh, the original um, coastline was um, and uh, because you didn't, you obviously wouldn't want to build your salt pans right uh, on uh, the coast. Um, at Cross Canonby, uh, this is two miles from where I live today and you've seen uh, this um, tank uh, timber structure in David uh, Cranston's talk, uh, but it also had a wooden pipe um, that uh, connected it to the shore in the same way as the pipe did at St. Moments. Uh, at a mid-tide level now, um, that has tide washing over it, except when there's uh, seabed movement and the sand is actually brought in and covers it all up. So you get nine inches of sand that comes in by the top, um, top right-hand uh, image uh, and gives it some protection. Uh, from all of the, uh, it, it, the abrasion that takes place. Um, two years ago, uh, additional movement of uh, sand uh, revealed a second brine pipe um, coming out uh, in this uh, bottom right hand slide um, that I believe would have carried uh, brine up to the uh, salt pans that are now protected by that gabion. And the initial um, interpretation uh, of that timber structure was perhaps it was um, for lifting the sea water up uh, to put it into a raised tank to feed it into the salt works uh, by gravity. Um, but in 1649, Frances Barwise describes in her lease that she had after her husband had died and she'd taken over the site, uh, that there were two salt pans water sumps, swath, and all singular other, the appurtenances thereunto belonging and appertaining. And I think that we've lost a tremendous amount of sand uh, off this beach, going out 100, 200 metres perhaps um, into the Solway. And that underneath that sand, these pipes were buried in the sand so that as water finds its own level, as the tide comes in, that uh, a brine tank uh, within the salt works could be filled up um, mid-tide um, by the incoming sea. And if I reconstruct on the left here, 
where the, if this is a constant high tide that currently is breaking uh, on the edge of the um, yellow face uh, of the salt works here. And the pipes that we've seen and the timber structure uh, are set up somewhere here. But if this pipe comes right the way down underneath the sand, um, it would um, perhaps look uh, a bit like in the model that I've got here. This is the Ironbridge Institute research paper 1995 that first uh, drew up the site. And these are the pipe inlets that would have carried the brine under the sand. So at high tide or mid tide level, the sea would just come up to these pipes. And as the time tide comes in further, the brine enters the pipes and then can flow directly into the uh, brine tank and that there would be um, inspection hatches, as it were, set up at intervals along the brine pipeline. And all of that yellow sand and all of those structures have now been eroded away and the tide comes all the way up to the foot of the salt works. And the scheduled bit of this area is the larger of the two circular uh, features. It doesn't include the buildings on the other side of the road, uh, and it doesn't include any of the structures that are now uh, eroding away in the sea. Um, so what I'm trying to do as I move forward with um, these um, models is to try and understand how each of them operated in a similar way. Uh, and I think that by using a process of systems engineering um, uh, and the basic principles about how these things might have operated, um, we could um, perhaps create equations that describe their efficiency. Um, the um, diagram that I show there is um, a, a mass diagram that we put together when we were trying to get historic uh, English heritage and the heritage lottery fund to uh, fund the restoration of the lion salt works. Um, we had a scheme whereby there would be a working salt pan alongside the um, heritage structures. Um, so it would actually demonstrate the process as well as show the heritage. But unfortunately, uh, it, it was a step too far for the heritage lottery fund. Uh, for some reason, they didn't feel that they could offer uh, fund a business and yet we still had to show the museum and the site could operate as a business and pay for itself and we wanted an income stream that would come from selling white salt made at the site by the same process but sadly that never happened uh, and perhaps the other thing is to perhaps create a Haynes manual for each of the salt works that splits them down into their individual parts uh, and enable us to describe the common components to all of them, and then the operational parameters to which they operate. And finally, uh, I just need a plug for uh, the organization that we set up on the back of the EU funded EcoCell Atlantis. Um, we have a, an annual newsletter, uh, Facebook page, and there's a Google map for the sites um, that I've been using in all of the research that I've been undertaking. Um, and I think I can draw that to a conclusion and perhaps open the floor to questions, um, not just about my talk, but about anything wider to do with salt making around the country. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any questions that they'd last, like to ask Andrew or Tom now. Um, feel free to put your hands up um, or add anything into the chat that you've you've got. Um, there's a nice comment there from Morag uh, thanking you, Andrew, and saying that King Lear would be proud of you.
doesn't seem that we've got any questions. Um, no, just... <laughs> everyone's trying to digest what you've, you've gone through. So it's very interesting. Um, okay, another positive comment from, from Simon Woody with there. Thanks, Simon. It probably is, I, I mean, I don't know, Simon can tell us how long ago that it was that he was excavating sites in, in salt sites in the Midlands. Hi, Simon. Um, hello. Um, it's when I first joined uh, Worcestershire County Council um, in the early middle 80s. Um, and uh, I, I, I found this um, absolutely fascinating. Um, it's uh, the your research is certainly, um, and and uh, and David's and and Tom's have, have certainly taken the uh, interest in salt to a lot further. Yeah. One of the things I most remember about that was because um, my wife Annalise was at Hereford and Worcester. Your county archaeology service then was the mud <laughs> everything was wet and muddy <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh, and um, had that sort of sulfurous uh, smell with all the organic material in it um it was rather smelly but yeah. um but you know yeah I, I quite like that smell actually but it's, it's just uh, a lot of people found it uh, quite obnoxious <laughs> Yeah. And of course, Droitwich now has its own salt works at Church House Farm. So it's one of yes. the, the, new, the growing number of artisan salt making sites that there are now scattered around the country. And they, they extract salt. Uh, I believe they, they extract salt from, from Droitwich. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and the sort of brine shaft there. Yeah. And the brine bath is also being restored. Um, I'm not so sure about that. It has closed been closed for quite a while but I think there's, there's um, the clan's still afoot yeah yeah it's good it's good experience somebody's asked why the salt industry declined um depends on your definition of declining um the certain i mean the, the vacuum salt works that are now they're all concentrated really um in Northwich, uh, because the multiple effective apparatus is so much cheaper. Um, but you might, I mean, the, the growth in the artisan sites around the country is enormous. Um, but given that over the years, people have endlessly tried to make salt more cheaply and use less fuel, um, you could go and have a look at some sums about how expensive a packet of dry vacuum salt costs from Northwich at about 60 pence a kilo and an artisan salt that sells for about six pounds for 150 grams. Do the maths on the price per tonne. Yeah, I think, Andrew, uh, uh, that I was talking about um, the um, in the 1300s, the, the salt was being imported from France. And that, as far as we know, is is again, the fact that they they have sun and we we tend not to. And, uh, you know, it's a mixture of, of that for us, plus the uh, diminishing supplies of peat, uh, it takes peat. Yeah, you know, years and years and years, centuries to grow, and uh, you know we used it. Uh, we used it all up basically. So, um, and the the French um, from their sun sites, uh, you know, they they didn't need to use any fuel really, or very little. That's right. Um, somebody's asked about when did mining start, and um, it was first discovered in Northwich in 1670, and um, then it starts to influence um, things across the whole country from the 1680s, 1690s. Um, but alongside the development or the, the discovery of rock salt, it has to go hand in hand with the construction of the weaver navigation um, and then distribution methods um, could carry 
bulk cargoes down to Frodsham Dock and Liverpool for exporting until the actual um, transport costs became cheaper. Northwich was still locked inland. Um, and that goes right the way back in the um, 17th century when the Royal Society is investigating um, salt because they wanted to get away from uh, importing stuff because we kept fighting with the Spanish and the French. Um, they, they ask a series of questions. They ask people in Droitwich um, how their salt compares with French salt. And they say, we don't know because we don't get fresh French salt up in Droitwich. And in fact, people in Bristol didn't receive Droitwich salt either because they were too busy importing it from overseas. Um, so really, that's why I want to kind of go back through all these timelines to actually see who was moving what and where, um, because lots of these things happen a lot later than you think. Yeah, the Hallstatt mines. Yeah, Hallstatt mines are much earlier. They go back, what, Iron Age, Tom, earlier? Yeah, they, they, um, the, certainly the height of it was um, Iron Age, and that's when there was a lot of uh, a lot of wealth and uh, rich burials in the area, weren't they? And, uh, um, but of course, um, the salt making in this country now uh, that Steve Steve's taking it back to to the Neolithic, so you know where where we are in in Lincolnshire, we were looking really from the the, the Middle Bronze Age onwards for um, for making salt. Not sure when uh, when uh, it started at Halstatt, but I know that the the peak of it was um, it's certainly known for its Iron Age, um, its Iron Age works. Um, yeah, the, uh, um, a lot of the on on the continent, um, the a, a lot of the, the very early um, salt working was uh, from. Um, salt wells, places in Romania, I think, from about what well, they're talking about six thousand BC. Certainly in in the Neolithic, um, people were, you know, were producing salt, creating salt from the from the brine wells there. So, I mean, it is is certainly an ancient industry. And as I say, with Steve, um, you know, taking it back now to what is it, Steve, three thousand BC, you think? Steve, so I was I was muted. Uh, the radiocarbon dates are three thousand seven hundred to three thousand eight hundred BC, and uh, the work I've done this year, I've got some, I've got some lower deposits. I don't think they're much earlier. I think it it's um, significantly happening around that time, but it's as I said, I'm really saying it's not a one hit wonder. There's more than one sultan. It's really yeah. an industrial concern at this time, which is. Uh, the the greater surprise surprise to me not just just finding it but now finding it happening on this industrial scale at, at this location is spectacular for me yeah yeah um, so somebody's asked why was salt mining so late in the UK um, it's mainly because deposits um, well they um, everybody was quite happy with sea salt and Northwich was uh, inland as was Droitwich um, and they only found the rock salt um, well they weren't looking for rock salt when they found it they were looking for coal because they'd been importing coal in Northwich from places like St Helens or out uh, on the Congleton side and they wanted to cut down on the transport costs and they thought if they could find coal where they were um, then it could reduce their operational costs but they found the rock salt instead and then that kicks off a whole different industry. And <clears throat> um, Steve, could I? Yeah. Steve, yeah. Could, could I just ask? I mean, I think one of the things, because people say, well, what, why didn't we find this before? Um, but I think. The reaction when you said you'd first found a salt working site dating to the Neolithic from the Neolithic researchers, the answer was, well, we don't have those in this country. Is that right? 
that was the that was the suggestion yes i i did get a bit of um surprise let's say uh, what i'm positing now is that much of it has been lost as part of as part of the dogger effect effectively with sea levels rising uh, if there were making salt on the east coast of yorkshire off, off red car um the work by Durham University has estimated that the sea levels in the Neolithic were between one and a half to two and a half metres lower than the present level. So the, the shoreline, if you stood on the beach at Redka, is at least 200 metres plus offshore from where, from, from where it is, is now in the Neolithic period. So any of that other earlier evidence has been completely lost. Um, I don't think Street House is unique as the only place making salt in the Neolithic. It's the only place that's survived in, in the Neolithic in, in the UK. That's the subtle dif difference um, that, I can, that I can explain. Yeah. There'll be something more about that on Digging for Britain, this, this coming series that came and filmed, filmed this, this year. So we've got some nice surprises for you for that, if you look out for that after Christmas. Good. Hmm. Okay, I think we're done, aren't we? We've got no more questions? I think so, unless there's any last minute questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting afternoon. You're welcome. Thanks to everybody who attended. Yeah. Thank you. Tom, can you stay on and can I can I ask you something just about what I've been doing and up to date?